Re Bonjour à toutes et tous. Euh, on, nous allons passer au, euh, au panel consacré à Virginia Woolf et à son roman The Waves, euh, en commençant par Nina Eldridge, euh, avec son intervention « Overwhelming yet fleeting experiences of time in Virginia Woolf's The Waves ». Uh, Nina is a PhD student at the University of Bordeaux Montaigne, where she also teaches literature and translation. The diversity of the different areas of her undergraduate studies had fostered a special interest in interdisciplinary studies. She is particularly interested in research on the links between literature and philosophy, literature and science, and literature and the visual arts. The PhD project focuses on James Joyce and Virginia Woolf's experimental works in the conception of space and time in the narratives, and is entitled Physics and Metaphysics of Literary Description in the Works of James Joyce and Virginia Woolf from 1914 to 1939. If you, if you would, the floor is yours. Um, can you hear me okay? Um, so, Virginia... <coughs> Virginia Woolf's The Waves is a novel-length balancing act between abundance and scarcity. The novel tells the story of six characters' entire lives, and yet it does so without overtly stating the traditional biographical character information that readers might be used to. We know nothing of parents or of last names, for instance. The result is that the characters are at first rather difficult for the reader to pin down. We lack the usual information that we are used to having and that would allow us to construct a coherent image of the characters. Instead, we open the book and receive an endless, overabundant stream of inner monologue. Virginia Woolf makes scarce what we want, what we're used to, and she gives us in abundance the things we're going to learn to want in a novel. I know for me personally, there's no going back anyway. Just as she plays with our expectations for the novelistic form, Wolf also plays on our understanding of time, particularly in regards to the opposition between inner and outer experiences of time and the narrative tensions that can be created between them. With this presentation, we'll first be looking at how characters are shown to feel they are masters of time, possessing it in abundance, and we'll then see how they deal with understanding that time escapes them. And finally, we'll look at how Wolf defines what is a moment and the tense balance between abundance and scarcity required for its definition. So first of all, we'll be looking at time as experienced when at the height of youth. Abundance and scarcity of course bring to mind the issue of resources. We value a given resource differently according to whether we find it abundant or scarce, and our behaviour changes accordingly. Those of you who are familiar with the waves will know of its interludes. These are short, italicised passages found between chapters. The novel's characters are absent from them, and in an experimental style, they describe the movements of the sun and the effects of its light on the landscape. The rising sun is paired with childhood, the setting sun with sunset. So the passage I would uh, first like to discuss is preceded by an interlude that describes the sun at noon. The sun risen, no longer couched on a green mattress starting a fitful glance through watery jewels, bared its face and looked straight over the waves. The strength of the sun's light banishes all shadow, all ambiguity, all uncertainty. Nothing es escapes it, and its reach will never be as thorough as it is now. In the interlude describing dawn, the horizon is blurred and there's confusion as to where exactly things begin and end, uh, so here the separation between things is marking a clear contrast to those earlier, earlier passages. And so same passage a little further on. The sun fell in sharp wedges inside the room. Whatever the light touched became dowered with a fanatical existence. A plate was like a white lake. A knife looked like a dagger of ice. The light brings out new qualities in the objects it interacts with. It has a transformative quality or rather it brings out potential fully. Uh, this idea of flourishing is pursued when the characters are shown in their early 20s. They've met together for dinner at a restaurant in London, and as per usual, the narrative is built from the different recorded impressions. How proudly we sit here, said Ginny. We who are not yet 25. Outside the trees flower. We look straight in front of us, ready for what may come. All is real. All is firm without shadow or illusion. 
Our differences are clear cut as shadows of rocks in full sunlight. Uh, so Ginny, who's the sort of um, beautiful socialite of the group, celebrates youth and its beauty. And here as well, outlines are sharp and contrasted. There's no doubt as to whether as to where things begin and end, uh, whether those things are rocks or the contours of a person's self. We have a solidity, a certainty, in the firmness that's experienced. There is a frankness in the ability to look straight in front. And this position, this way of being, brings out an optimistic, far-reaching view of life and of time. With infinite time before us, said Neville, we ask, what shall we do? All is to come. There's a feeling when at the peak that the vast expanses before us are infinite. However, this is actually an illusion. And in the moment where we think everything is before us, the end has actually already begun. Everything is always in motion. We identify points on the trajectories of moving objects for the sake of conceptualizations or calculation. But the moving object merely passes through this point. It never stops at it. The sun doesn't achieve or remain its peak, and neither do we. We see uh, this idea a little further on when Ginny uses more imagery from the natural world. Now the fruit is swollen beneath the leaf. The fruit is perfect in its deciduousness. Its ripeness also means it's about to fall. The fulfillment of potential is also the announcement of an impeding perishing. The shadows were next, never actually quite banished by the sun, but were instead lying in wait for when they could begin to return. This is actually announced from the uh, start hinted at at the end of the interlude I quoted earlier. And as the light increased, flocks of shadows were driven before it and conglomerated and hung in many pleated folds in the background. Uh, I really like the sartorial connotation of pleats uh, because it gives us this idea that sh the shadows have been put away carefully and will be immediately ready uh, for when it's time for them to be taken out again. And that time is very much imminent as we, as we shall see. So time and tide indeed uh, do not wait for one of the characters, Bernard, as he realises one day whilst shaving. Uh, so this passage I'm about to uh, quote is the opening to a new chapter and is preceded by an interlude where the sun has begun on its descent. And time, said Bernard, lets fall its drop. The drop that has formed on the roof of my soul falls. On the roof of my mind, time, forming, Let's fall its drop. Last week, as I stood shaving, the drop fell. I, standing with my razor in my hand, became suddenly aware of the merely habitual nature of my action. This is the drop forming. The drop fell. Wolf gives us here a rather prosaic scene. So many of us in the bathroom mirror have noticed the signs of ageing. Uh, here the metaphor of drops helps us to understand the steady and regular passage of time. And while it may not seem much as a single drop, it is the steady, continuous rhythm of these drops that creates a build-up and renders us able to say that something has changed. As, Bern as sorry, Bernard pinpoints further on, what is lost, what is over, and as I buttoned on my coat to go home, I said more dramatically, I have lost my youth. Bernard understands that these drops, that time is an agent of change, and then he articulates what that change is. Bernard also mentions the drops as forming on the roof of his soul and on the roof of his mind. Uh, because he specifically says forming and on, I would argue that we're invited to think of the formation of stalactites on the roof of a cave, and hence that Wolf is picturing souls and minds as caves. In any case, the passage of time is associated with the creation of fixity. The more time passes, the more identity becomes fixed, similar to the formation of a stalactite. Its matter is at first liquid and then solidifies, and it's because it solidifies that, that it becomes what it is, that we can point at it and say, that's a stalactite, rather than just a puddle. Fixity as a condition, um, sorry, fixity as a condition for identity comes up in another instance of natural imagery, uh, which is the image of growing rings like a tree. Uh, so, as I said, this comes up several times. We have it twice here associated to identity and once uh, more explicitly linking it to the rings of trees, not just any rings. 
uh, and intuitively we have a rather easy understanding of a young spruce being very uh, flexible, whereas the trunk of an old oak tree would be much firmer and certainly less likely to be moving or going anywhere. Um, now, not only might we become fixed by time, we might also be swept up in its movement. This idea is quite present with passages where time is pictured as a stream. So here we have how fast the stream flows from January to December, our lives to stream away. So time, like a stream, is something that we cannot stop. Its currents are much stronger than us, and if we don't pay attention to it, its passage uh, continues and will catch us unaware. Wolf also uses the image of a procession, especially in regards to time as understood in its broader historical view, making the characters and their lifespans seem very small by contrast. Louis, in particular, is very susceptible to this way of seeing life. And actually the very first thing Louis says in the novel when they're all young children and taking in what they can see from the garden around them uh, is about a rhythmic stamping. He says, I hear something stamping. A great beast's foot is chained. It stamps and stamps and stamps. This chained beast is a creeping image in the underlying fabric of the novel. It seems to denote the greater rhythms, the greater movements of the world. There's a particular... Um, um, sorry, there's... There's the presence of something that exists on a much broader, a much larger scale than the characters. And so, whether we're ready or not, with the passage of time, youth, youth will be lost and our identity will be fixed. The march of time will march us on. Wolf, however, also shows us the suspension of this march, and that is to be found in the paradox of what is a moment. So, what is a moment? Uh, it's something that lasts no time at all, and yet it might be long enough to warrant a name for itself under definition. I was inspired to write this paper from one particular turn of phrase in the final chapter when Bernard is recollecting. Uh, he's remembering an evening from their youth when all six characters had dinner at Hampton Court and they experienced a moment of shared emotion. So this is the kind of famous communion or ep epiphany scene. And so he says, we for one moment out of what measureless abundance of past time and time to come burnt their triumphant. The moment was all. The moment was enough. Bernard is describing an experience where there was the sensation that time in its entirety could be held within a singular focused moment. An experience where one thing, a fleeting moment, contains its exact opposite, the overwhelming abundance of all of time. Uh, the state isn't a common occurrence, uh, there's quite a um, particular ritual to get into it, and in this quote Bernard, at the end of his life, is remembering it as a shared experience at Hampton Court. He says, but we, against the brick, against the branches, we six, out of how many million millions, for one moment, etc. It's important that when he remembers it, he remembers it as shared, and emph emphasises the togetherness. Uh, it's also emphasised when the experience is initially described before the recollection. But here and now we are together, said Bernard. We have come together at a particular time to this particular spot. We are drawn into this communion by some deep, some common emotion. So there's the creation of something only possible due to the participation of those involved, a communion often in the ways the characters um, are shown as being so different from one another, and it's these differences that create the multitude of impressions um, that um, is highly appreciated in criticism of the novel. Uh, yet here it's precisely because they have, something co they have something in common together that the passage is possible. Um, this experience of the moment, however, is obviously not a permanent solution. Bernard then goes on to describe how most of them broke away from the moment in question. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh yeah, sorry, I got lost in my slides, but I'm back. <laughs> um, 
So the moment was all, the moment was enough. And then Neville, Ginny, Susan and I, as a wave breaks, burst asunder, surrendered, to the next leaf, to the precise bird, to a child with a hoop, to a prancing dog, to the warmth that is hoarded in woods after a hot day, to the lights twisted like white ribbon on rippled waters. We drew apart. Um, I'm sorry. Um, what's important here is that when Bernard says they surrender, what they are surrendering to is life resuming. We have a list of rather ordinary things, nothing that was actually there with them that evening at Hampton Court. There wasn't a child with a hoop or a prancing dog. Uh, these listed items are sort of stand-ins for the random occurrences of life or for the random thoughts we might have. Um, so moving on, if this amazing moment is not life and not time, what then is it? Uh, it's not immediately described, it's not uh, explicitly labelled, but Bernard, still uh, remembering, goes on to call it a dissipation. He says, I could not recover myself from that endless throwing away, dissipation, flooding forth without, uh, without our willing it. I could not recover myself from that dissipation, so we parted. Dissipating means scattering, dividing the objects and dispersing the pieces. One of the older definitions of dissipating is the reduction to atoms or the reduction to an impalpable condition, uh, which I think fits quite well here with the endless throwing away. Any dispersal, any type of dispersal, makes it much more difficult to trace the circumference of the object described, or if what is being dispersed is the person, makes it much more difficult to uh, circumscribe who they are, the circumference of that self. Or in the language of the waves, it makes it difficult to say, I am this, I am that. Uh, so keeping in mind this image of being taken apart down to our components, let's look at how Bernard further describes the experience. Was this then, this streaming away, mixed with Susan, Ginny, Neville, Rhoda, Louis, a sort of death, a new assembly of elements, some hint of what was to come? So they're taken apart and then reassembled, but reassembled differently, uh, meaning they come to a different state of being, or a different state of not being, if we keep with this hypothesis of it being a sort of death. We also have the term streaming away, meaning they're not the initiators of the, move of the movement that's happening. Again, they're being taken along by its rhythm. In keeping with dissipation, the image, uh, the image here would be uh, the pieces of them falling and being swept along by the stream. And later on, uh, Bernard does use his image of drops again to describe not only aging, but the erosion of his sense of self. Drop upon drop, said Bernard, silence falls. But now silence falling pits my face, wastes my nose like a snowman stood out in a yard in the rain. As silence falls, I am dissolved utterly and become featureless and scarcely to be distinguished from another. A loss of the outline of oneself is a loss of oneself. Something again summed up by Bernard in a moment of shared emotion or communion with the others. I do not remember my special gifts or idiosyncrasy or the marks I bear on my person, eyes, nose or mouth. I am not, at this moment, myself. We can also solidify this interpretation by looking at the journey back, so away from dissolved snowman and back into normal life, and by looking at how Bernard slips out of that dissolved snowman mindset. And so he says, but as I put down my glass, I remember. I am engaged to be married. I am to dine with my friends tonight. I am Bernard, self. Uh, so this myself is only in the British version, not in the American version. Um, it only says, I am Bernard. Um, but the simple act of remembering draws Bernard out of shared ex ecstasy. The narrative moves from general statements and we statements back into I statements. Bernard is reaffirming himself and stepping out of the peculiar state of suspension where there's a collective being. 
he's falling back into the passage of time and back into its consequences. Um, one of those consequences being time as an agent of fixing identity. Uh, for Bernard, his engagement is a sign of fixity. Um, so in the earlier passage I quoted um, where Neville says, with infinite time before us, we ask what shall we do? All is to come. Bernard's immediate answer is, for you, but yesterday I walked bang into a pillar box. Yesterday I became engaged. Uh, so in any case, this peculiar experience of the moment, though it animates a lot of the narrative in the waves, is not something that can be held for too long. It feels like forever, but it lasts only a second, and as a sort of death, it must be pushed aside when life resumes. So to conclude, this odd nature of time is a theme that vibrates throughout the waves. We are able to feel how time is something that completely surrounds us and completely dictates our experience of life. And yet, upon reading, we also understand the sensation of time as something that simply cannot be grasped. Thank you.